Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, yes, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a live Caribbean Cricket Podcast show. You must have thought we were going to start on time. Are you crazy? <laughs> we can't start this on time. We, we give you a time and then we turn up when we feel like it. Ladies and gents, the band is back together. I'm Mashal St. Patrick here, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And with me today, today of course, is my partner in crime. Yes, and Tokyo. And firstly, everyone just say your prayers for my Wi-Fi. Hopefully it can hold out on this uh, Thursday night. But Mash, we've got a big test analysis coming up, test squad analysis. There was only one guy we had to bring him back. We haven't seen him for a while. Nikhil, welcome back. How are things, man? Oh, everything's good, man. Really good to be back, as always, with you guys. Um, obviously, very important series ahead in terms of Bangladesh and I think a very important year in terms of Western cricket on the whole. So happy to be here and you know, in the midst of discussion with you guys, man. Looking forward to it. Most definitely. If everyone's, again, as usual people, I know you always want the kill back, but these negotiations we have to go through with Listen. the kill's agent, man. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> but um Nikhil, listen, let I'll, I'll be honest with the people. Um I sent you a message about I don't know 24 hours ago saying Nikhil, we're gonna do a live show tomorrow because we need to talk on this test squad and this president's eleven squad that's been announced. And people, this is no lie. For about 30 minutes, Santoki, myself, and Nikhil were just cussing about various different things, various different things in the WhatsApp chat. In the end, I said we have to hold fire and just bring the cuss out straight to the live show instead because there's some, the, squ the squads are, are interesting. Uh, some mm -hmm. controversial calls, some calls that make no sense. But before we dive into it, because I've got better at doing this stuff, very, very quickly, people, if you're joining us for the first time ever, or even if you're somebody who's new, you can support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast at www.patreon.com forward slash Caribbean Cricket. Big up everybody who's been supporting us recently uh, during the Netherlands tour, post Netherlands, etc. Big up everybody who has... One second. Big up everybody who has bought a Caribbean Cricket Podcast um, hoodie. We're nearly sold out. There's only nine left. Nikhil, you haven't sent me your address. I would have sent you one by now. But you I thought I would have gone for free, man. Come on. Yeah, man. no, that's what I, but I need your address, Nikhil. Obviously, you can't say it live <laughs> on air. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as Nikhil sends me his address, he can get one sent to him mad, mad, um, mad. in whichever size he needs. But people, there's only nine left. Make that eight left because Nikhil's getting a free one. So there's only eight left of these people. Get at us before they completely sell out. Um, so yeah, you can support that way as well. Uh, obviously, follow the Caribbean Cricket Podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Carib Cricket. And if that's not good enough, just go to our website. We've had a new facelift for the website. The new picture on it is uh, Puran and the guys winning the three ODIs uh, versus the Netherlands. We should have won that ODI versus Pakistan as well, but this we're not talking about that um, in in this particular show. Mm. Colleagues, let's uh, get straight into it. Let me bring this up first. People, we're not going to start with a test squad. We're going to start with um, the, the President's eleven squad um, because that's quite interesting. So actually, Santok, is that a three-day game, did they say? Yeah, it's a three-day game starting tomorrow. Shiv Narayan Chandapur's assistant coach. I'm not sure who the actual head coach is, but yeah, starting tomorrow. So looking forward to that. But Mash, if you want to pull up, pull up the names that have been named in this squad, because we've got a lot to talk about. Right. So uh, people, the squad for the President's eleven game, which starts against Bangladesh tomorrow, as Santoki said, Yannick Karaya, captain. Uh, Yannick Karai, of course, in fact, I'll read what Desmond Haynes said, because that's quite interesting. Desi said, Yannick Karai is captain Trinidad and Tobago at youth level, and he was also the captain of the West Indies Emerging Players team, which won Super 50 in 2019. That's the same team that Josh in. We are looking at future leaders. We need to start identifying these persons as early as possible. While we need some assistance from the territories as well, we want to make sure there are leaders we can identify and begin grooming for the future of West Indies cricket. While we need some assistance Ooh. from the territories sorry, as well, people. We that's, uh, sure is that, sorry, people. That's how you know I'm not professional. But anyways, um, so 
that's why Yannick Correa um, has been named the captain. Um, and then we have Colin Archibald, uh, Alec Athanas, I said it wrong again, uh, Tej Narayan Shandapur, Brian Charles, um, it should be Athanas actually, Roston Chase, Tevlin Imlak, Jeremiah Louis, Preston McSween, Marquino Minley, Jeremy Solazano, and Jomel Warrican. Santoki, I'm coming to you first. Let's hmm. unpick this um, President's eleven. What's the first talking point you want to bring up about that eleven? I think, firstly, the omission of uh, Shane Dow, which is an interesting one. Obviously, he captained the President's eleven against the. Uh, England. So he's been dropped. Tevin Imlach has been brought in, wicketkeeper from Guyana. In the last three regional games, I think he's made scores all over half a century at least. So he's been brought in. I think that that's a big, big call. Nikhil, what are your thoughts on Dalwich not being in this presence eleven? Yeah, I think, oh man, you guys looking, for, looking to start me off hot, man. Honestly, <laughs> I, I, I must say I was kind of surprised. You have, you pick a presence eleven team and, and sort of in the last series against England and you lead, you have a leader in terms of the captain. For me, I think this presidency 11, I would love some more clarity in terms of what it really is, because in the last two selections, I've been extremely confused. If you look at Shane Dulwich, who, you know, made his return finally to, to professional cricket, played for Barbados, got 86, I think, in the first run out for the Pride. Um, and obviously was instantly elevated to the captaincy role. So here I am thinking, OK, good. They've, they've trusted in Dulwich. Obviously, we know what he's done at the international level. He's proven in the test level, obviously, for many years. Get him back into the system. Let's play him in, in the presence 11 games against international opposition and let's see what he can produce. Obviously, he did struggle in, in those games, against, in that game against England, sorry. But to see him completely out of the team and then you go to Tevin Imbla, I'm all for, for giving the youth and young talent, you know, forward and, and giving them the opportunities. But I just think to completely drop him out of the squad, where's the continuity? And that's, that's to mm. me where I really have questions about this presence 11 team. Um, just the fact that he's not there. It just seems that it's lacking continuity. When players are picked for that presidency 11 game, you know, I really think that you're in the system, you're close, or, you know, you want to be given a fair opportunity. And I just think one game is not enough. Before I come in, it's just because, Mr. Lover, if I don't put it up now, you'll lose the facts. And thank you for the super chat comment. Um, so, Mr. Love, I'm just reading it, but we will come back to your talking points later because not all of them apply just yet. So, Mr. Lover just says, congrats to the future debutants and record players in the test squad. Rifa Thomas, uh, Multi, Philip, and Tej Narain. I think we'll talk about Tej Narain in a second, but I just wanted to bring up Mr. Lamb's comment there before it times out. Um, yeah, just on uh, uh, on uh, Dowrich, I agree with both of you. And it's interesting, as the kill kind of hinted at there, there was no explanation as to what the purpose of this President's Eleven is. Beyond saying that, oh, Yannick, it's about future captains, which I find, I'm fine with that. I've got no issue with that particular comment. Um, I would have thought that a president's 11 would be the next 11 players that you're looking at for immediate test match debut should people fail. Yeah. And there's just some names in there that make... Uh, I mean, in fairness, Santoki, I'm surprised you're not bigging up your boy Tevin Moore because in fairness, you could argue his runs collection in the last three rounds for Guyana justify why he's there, but then... Why would we put Dowrich to the wayside already? I don't fully understand. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think Tevin has done well, but he's only played five first class games. So then what are you basing the president's level on, basically? Is it like you say, players who are on the verge of getting back or making a back, or are we looking at it from pretend long term? I think we just need a bit of clarity on there. But there are some options like Jeremy Solazano, Tej Narayan Chandapur. Roston Chase, for instance, they make logical sense for being in this President's eleven because they're people who have either been in the test side or are looking to get into it. So they make sense. So it's not completely surprising eleven, but there are obviously some questions that will be raised. Um, Michelle, what are, you, what are your thoughts on Jeremy Solazano? Obviously, he's had a terrible time in the regional season for Trinidad and Tobago. Do you think the fact that he was called up for a test match in Sri Lanka means that he should be in this President's eleven based on that fact that he was in the test side not long ago? I don't think Solazano should be there. I'm going to be brutal. I mean, what's his return? So his five matches, uh, four matches, sorry, because I think he was injured in the first one. His four matches in the championship, uh, West Indies Championship, 162 runs, two fifties, an average of 27. Um, I mean, the thing is, my thing is, the current selectors don't owe Solazano anything. 
it was Roger Harper and um, Miles Bascom who picked Jeremy Solazano and obviously Phil. Mm. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Desmond Haynes and obviously Sarwan's no longer a selector, didn't owe Solazano anything. So my question is, what has Solazano done? Or sorry, beyond the fact he's 26, 27, what has he done to justify this spot? And if, again, and Nikhil, Nikhil said this on many of our shows in the past, what's the point of the Red Bull Championship if you don't reward mm. the players who are at the top of the Red Bull Championship? Yeah. So there's four openers who did well, technically five. Craig, obviously, top run scorer. Mm. Um, Tej, Kieran Powell, uh, John Campbell. So actually it's four. Mm. Now, I know Kieran Powell has failed. I know he has. So I get why you wouldn't go back there again. But is somebody averaging 27 after six innings really? Uh, I don't know, guys. I just, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I yeah. think on the, just on the basis of, I, that's why I'm thinking like, it's just a conflict of sort of their interest. Because if, if you're picking players based on performances, like, then you'll see, you know, a Tevin M. Lack in the team, etc. Then fine. Um, then I can I can argue for Kieran Paul. But if you're looking to the future, then maybe I could see why you would have a Jeremy Solozano. But you can't, in one instant, have a Solozano in the team looking to the future. But then after five games, you bring in Tevin M. Lack and just do it with Shane Dorich, who we've seen at test level. That's the problem with me. For me, sorry, it's the inconsistency that, that I have the issue with. Mm. And guys, do you think, obviously, Rakeem Cornwall was the top wicket taker, but they've gone for Brian Charles in the squad as the right arm. Off break, and obviously, who else is in there? Chemo Paul as well has not been picked despite his performances. Do well, either of you can come in. Do you think that this is a a contradictory reflection on the kind of regional regional standards? If you're topping the charts in the runs or wicket taken, you're not making even the president's eleven. What, what do you think this reflects on kind of the regional season? Um, so I wonder. I, somebody on Twitter sent a message about is Cornwall done. Now, I would have Raheem Cornwall as my first... I would still have Raheem Cornwall as my first-choice spinner in the West Indies team if I had to pick someone. Um, this tells me that Raheem is now out of the side. And if Raheem is now out of the side, this tells me that his weight issues will not let him get back in the side. That's my gut feeling here. Because it can't be based on ability because Raheem's the best spinner in the region. Um, if we're going on st uh, statistical analysis, and even if you go on test record in terms of what he's done for West Indies in recent times, you'd probably still go with Rakeem. Of course, his ability to bat as well. Brian Charles, I always think it's important to raise stats. Brian Charles um, with the ball took, uh, where is it? Where is it? Let me find this guy. Was it 14 wickets? Uh, where is, oh, 16 wickets at 28 in his five matches as a as a with his off breaks right rakeem took 23 wickets mm -hmm. same amount of matches at 21. um i don't know i don't nikhil where do you stand on I, I, and the thing is nikhil we can't even go with an age thing here because rakeem cornwall's mm -hmm. not old so i don't really get the brian charles versus rakeem cornwall thing there to be honest you guys are looking at for the presidency love and angle but i'm even looking at it from the test team level i look at this the makeup of this bangladesh squad They've got three potential bat batters inside the top order who are left-handers. Tammy McBall, Tajmo Santo, and, of course, Mohamed al Haq, as well as Shakiba Hassan, all left-handers. So here you are, you picked a left-arm spinner. For Antigua, yes, mind you, it may not spin a whole lot, but I do believe they will go with a spinner at least. And especially with the absence of a roster chase, granted, Gudekesh Moti has shown us that he can bat with that 100 against Barbados, but... Do we really want to carry this much inexperience into such an important home series like this? I may have sided with Raheem Cornwall, and especially I think the presence eleven alone is a, this is I just can't understand how we can't make that team taking the most wickets if if it is a feeder system and if we're saying that presence eleven players are rewarded from good performances in a regional cricket. That I cannot understand what's the reasoning, but I'm talking about even for the test team. I think I may have gone for an off spinner, especially with the absence. Up and off spinning all around like a Roston Chase, etc. I really can't understand how he's not in either of the teams. So I'm telling you before you come in, just because I have just seen that Medvis, yeah. thank you, Medvis, for the super chat. Sorry for not bringing it up earlier. So just Medvis, just further to that Imlac uh point. Yes, Imlac, of course, was part of that 2016 team. And like Carty in the LDI squad, it's good to see some of these players now coming through. Remember, people, in, in West Indies cricket, it takes our players about six years 
to try and find their real self. Um, so it makes sense that Imlac's only coming to the fore now. Um, so, yeah, let's hope he can continue. Sorry, Santoki, come through. I was going to say, obviously, a lot of comments are saying Shannon Gabriel should have been in this side. Now, it'd be interesting to get you guys' opinion on this. Obviously, he hasn't played a test since last year against Sri Lanka, missed the England series, didn't do too well for Trinidad. Do you think someone of the calibre of Shan Shannon Gabriel needs to, quote-unquote, prove himself in this President's eleven, Or is it a case of once he's back up to full fitness, you just throw him back in the test side as soon as? But my thing is, he played, I think Shannon played all of the matches for Trinidad. Mm. He, he might have missed one. So what are they saying that he's still not fit? And if he's still not fit, then I'm I'm about to say that Shannon might be done, you know, mm. because we don't have any more Red Bull cricket for Shannon this year. Um, if he's if they're not going to pick him versus Bangladesh, our next Red Bull cricket is um Australia at the end of the year. Now, granted, they could take him to Australia because of the pace and the bounce in the Australian tracks. But what Red Bull cricket is he going to play before that? Yeah, they, exactly. Unless they run another uh, West Indies Championship in November, December. When, in fairness, that's when it normally is, in fairness. So it could be that we start another season of uh, Red Bull Championship in October, November through to 2023. But, boy, it's looking sticky for Shannon, you know. It, it's, it's looking super sticky. Because if... if if Alzari Joseph or Anderson Phillip come through, and then obviously Kimar Roach is a certainty once he's back, Jason Holder is a certainty once he's back, there's an argument to say Sh Shannon doesn't get his way back in. Yeah. I just look at this, the construct of this bowling attack, and I just can only fathom or imagine how, how fantastic it would be to have a Shannon Gabriel at full fitness firing in his prime, you know, in this lineup, because it's a very inexperienced paced attack, bowling attack on a whole. And I think even with the, an absence of a Kimar Roach or a Jason Holder, having a Shannon Gabriel is someone you can rely on. But I just don't think he's shown enough in the four-day championship to say that, you know, he can give you a consistent, solid two tests or three tests, et cetera. So I think it was too much of a risk, and, and that's why they didn't opt for him. And, and, it, I, I, and in fairness, I don't think it's a bad idea not to include him in the presidency 11 because you want to see some others. You want to give the chance to the Matsuina, Jeremiah Louis, uh, Marquinho, Mendy, who are all impressive. Yeah, we, we must, of course, shout out Jeremiah Louis, um, other than Kimo Paul. But Louis technically was statistically the best bowler this season. Uh, five matches, 18 wickets uh, for the Leeward Islands at 20. Um, and that's been following up, and not, COVID notwithstanding, that's been following up generally an upward trend for Jeremiah Louis in general. So it's good to see him definitely get a chance. Marquino Mindley, was it against... Barbados, where he got the five first. So Mark Marquino Minley has been doing well for Jamaica for a while. He's been in and around the setup. Preston McSween, they will have gone for because he offers left arm pace. They will obviously want to have a look at the fact that he offers that variety. So I agree with Nikhil um, on the seamers. Nikhil, just because I've just mentioned Barbados, uh, Chamar, is he still is he still injured? Yeah, he's still he's still injured, man. I mean, even in the club tournament that we have, his team. As you know, his team is not in the final, but he even hasn't really been bowling much. It's, it's a really sad thing because obviously it's someone that had, you know, a lot of potential, still has a lot of potential, but it's just tough fast bowlers in terms of injuries, et cetera, because really and truly he was ahead of, of the likes of a Jaden Seals, et cetera. I mean, made his debut before New Zealand, as, as that person said. I'm really unfortunate to see what's happened with him, but I'm hoping that he can make a recovery soon and, and come back to the Barbados Pride team and then work his way back in. Before I go to the next question, gents, uh, Kurt says McCoy should be in a test team. Listen, I'm going to say this for the <laughs> final time. Obed can't even prove that he can bowl 10 overs in white ball cricket in ODI, much less come and suddenly bowl in the test team. I don't think we'll ever see Obed McCoy play test cricket. I'm not convinced he's got the injury record that would allow him to anyway. So people, like I said on Twitter the other day, let's just be grateful we've got Obed in at least one format of cricket yeah. right about I think, now. I think Obed's, Obed's essentially the West Indian version of like a time L Mills. We just have to hope that he can hold himself together for T20s. He wouldn't be able to ever push himself, as you say, for anything longer than that realistically. Gents, there's one person we haven't mentioned. Let's, let, in fact, two actually I want to talk on still in this team. Um, sorry, Yannick Karai I haven't mentioned because I think his pick is a... I think that's obvious. Like I've got no issue with that Yannick Karai pick. Uh, whatsoever. I'm, I've got no issue with him being captain. For those who don't know, Yannick Karaya was the I think sixth or seventh top scorer in a very bad Trinidad batting lineup. Um, Yannick Karaya scored 314 runs at 45 with 102 50s. That follows him having a good super 50 as well. So I think this Yannick Karaya fit 
makes sense to me. Um, but Tej, let's talk on Tej. Lots of people. Um, in fact, I was caught on camera during that Netherlands match saying bring Tej into the test squad. Um, and people like people are saying that that was uh, went out on live TV feed. I genuinely thought they'd bring Tej into the test squad as a backup opener. I never expected him to replace John Campbell. Santoki will back me up here. I always <laughs> said that John Campbell would keep his place. The Q will get into that in a minute when we look at the test squad. Should Tej, the question I've got for you both is, should Tej have gone straight into the test squad? I'm not even saying team, I'm just saying squad. Or is it right that we now test Tej at the next level up beyond regional, which is a President's eleven game? Santoki, over to you first. I think I think it's right to have him in his President's eleven if you're saying the President's eleven is a step up to the test side, just because I think as great as Tej has been in the last three rounds of the regional game, it's a compressed amount of time. It's essentially what three weeks he's been in this rich reign of scoring. He's let before that he's lacked the consistency. So I guess we kind of rather than just throwing him straight into the test side, we kind of need to see if he can work up to the next level, which is performing against senior international players such as he will face against Bangladesh. So for me, I think they've named him as a reserve in the test side, partly because if he does a big if he does a big performance against this Bangladesh side in the warm-up, they could potentially throw him into that test side for the second test, for instance. So I think this is a good way to kind of check out if Tej can maintain his form at a slightly higher level than what we've seen in regional cricket. Nikhil, before I come to you, uh, thank you, Kev. Big fan of the podcast, Kev, uh, for the <laughs> super chat. Kev says, and we're not on the test squad, Nikhil, but you can't talk Tej without talking John at the same time, I guess. Uh, Kev says, Campbell must have photos of selectors in dubious situations. You've got to look to the future. How many more disappointing performances at test level will we accept from Campbell? So I guess try and do a bit of both, Nikhil. Should Tej have been in instead of John? Would you have had Tej and John in the squad? Where where do you stand on it? Would you even had would you have even had Tej in general? Yeah, I think it's very hard um to, to not include Tej in China Paul. Um you look at 439 runs in the in the four day championship, but I think it's very funny in terms of how, how life has worked out because you look at the three matches in the championship before, you know, before we took that break for the England series and many people were calling for him to be actually dropped. It's only because Vishal Singh was actually unavailable to play the morning of the game. He mm -hmm. got the opportunity against Barbados, made two bats about hundreds and now life is completely different. But I look at sort of his record, 13 innings before that hundred, he passed 20 twice, you know, so it's, it, he was really struggling. Um, but to see this turn around, I, I do think is extremely remarkable. I know we're going to get into it some more when we look at the test team. For me personally, I won't. I'll, I'll save the test team argument and the John Cam argument for when we do get there. But I will say, I would. I would have had him in the in the test squad. Um, I'm I'm all for him being in the presence of eleven because he was not in the last squad against England. So they may be looking at a case where you know we want to test them before they get to the test team. Even though I think there's a lot of inconsistencies there, but nonetheless. He had Solozano and Shea Mosley opening the body in the last game against England, the last President's Eleven game. Now you have China Paul and, and Solozano. I'm, I'm all for that. I personally, though, would have had him in the test team, and I'll, I'll save my sentiments to explain why when we do get, get over to that discussion. Medvis says, uh, I want Tej in the test side, but he wasn't brilliant in the previous four-day series season. It's like an emerging boxer. You want to build him up. Don't just throw him into the fire. So I think we're all accepting that Tay should definitely have been in at least the President's eleven. Yeah. Um, whether he should have gone straight into a test squad or not, well, that's another question altogether. I've got one more person to talk on, Santogi. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I coming for, Santogi? Who am I coming for? <laughs> I just want... Listen, people, I just want an explanation. Ruston has been bowling well... <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, no, hold on. Nah, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not even trying to come for him like that. I'm just saying, right? Desi said, when I went to the last um, press conference, Desmond Haynes said, listen, Roston and Darren Bravo have to hold a drop. They need to go find form. Cool. I heard that and I said, good, because everyone must be able to hold a drop when they've lost form. The Presidency 11 isn't the test squad. But what position is Roston Chase actually back in in this squad? So, Nikhil, I'm coming to you first as the resident uh, Bar Barbadian. I reckon Roston Chase might be reinventing himself as a number 11 now, you know, who bowls off spin as his primary suit. What do you reckon? B 
Because that, that's surely the only reason he's in the side. He's not batting in the top six. He can't bat in the top six. I find I think you guys are being harsh, man, to be honest. Whilst he has he struggled in the in the four-day championship, I think Roston Chase is, is a needed commodity in the West Indies test team. Obviously, not now. I think he's he struggled in the last couple of games, obviously the last couple of tests that he's played in. But that all around ability, I mean, okay, yes, his batting hasn't lived up to the expectation that we expect, you know, from years ago where he's played that scored that hundred in Sab Sabina Park draw with India or even the 100 against Pakistan. I mean, we've seen him at the height of, of his career in terms of what he can achieve. I think based on that, the selectors have opted, you know, to keep in mind and around the setup. I think with the off-spin ability as well, eight wickets against England, um, you know, his Sri Lanka performances, he's just very valuable. I think his all-round ability is extremely valuable. It changes the entire outlook of this West Indies team because if you look at a situation like this, let's say he was firing and he's in this current West Indies test squad. There you have not only an experienced member in the top order, but then you don't have to sacrifice a position to play a spinner because you trust Chase's bowling enough. So I think for those reasons, I, I'm in support of him getting this added opportunity. And I do think, you know, they're, they're, he's someone that they have identified as someone that they can use. He's resilient. You know, we've seen him battle through times of fortitude, and I expect him to come back from, from this poor on a form as well. Where, and maybe Santel, you want to jump in, where would you put him, though? Let's just say Chase makes it back into the test squad in the near future. Where does he go now? Because my thing is he's got to be at the highest he can bat in our side now is number eight. Yeah. So I have let me just clarify, I have nothing against Roston's bowling. I actually think he's slowly turning into an adequate to very adequate off spinner, right? If he could find his batting form again, as Nick Nikhil is right, it would totally change the. It would really balance the side up. But where does he currently get to bat? Santoki, sorry. I would, yeah, I agree, Mash. I think I would go with him at eight and nine if he's going to be the frontline spinner. But just because his batting form, unless unless we see a dramatic improvement, but I don't know how would you gauge that dramatic improvement? Where would he show, be able to show that? So if you're throwing him into the test side, you'd have to put him eight or nine. You couldn't put him in the top six. I, I would say. It'll be it'll be interesting. I, I hope he makes some runs, you know, because at the end of the day, my thing is I always want players to do well because it puts pressure on other players. One of the biggest issues West Indies have is they don't have enough players playing well. So therefore, you can afford to underperform because you know your pressure is never really under place. So I wish everybody who's playing in the President's Eleven a strong match to, to, to ask questions mm -hmm. of the test um, side. I think it's interesting that. Roston Chase is the only one in this President's eleven who's had substantial test experience. They haven't picked like a Kieran Powell or a Shy Hope to come in his side. So there's obviously a reason they put him in this eleven. They obviously want to try something different in terms of his role. So it'd be interesting to see how they do play him tomorrow. There was just one quote before we move on to the test squad. There was a question I wanted to bring up earlier on. Let me find it. Uh, I don't know if I can... One second. Here we go. Um, I've lost it. A couple of people are asking about Casey Carty. And they were saying, wait a minute, he was in the last President's eleven. How comes he's not in this? But people, he's in the ODI squad. Like, what? what <laughs> there's two more games to go in that ODI tournament. This this match starts tomorrow, so he can't be there. And he's not going to get into the test squad because the test, the test match starts next week, Wednesday. These ODI players, and that may be why Brooks isn't in the old in the test squad, because I'm really yeah. surprised at that. Maybe the kill's going to talk on that. Like I, I, I'm. Anyways, let's get into the test squad because, boy, there's some questions, there's some questions about this test squad. So, people, uh, sorry, Jayla, before I talk on it, yes, the next ODI is tomorrow, twelve o'clock UK time. So that must be what six p.m., six six a.m. Jamaica, seven a.m. like Barbados and everybody else, I presume. Uh, so that's a match tomorrow. Um, so the test squad people: Craig Brathwaite, captain; J uh, Jermaine Blackwood, vice captain; Inkruma Bonner, John Campbell, Josh De Silva. Alzari Joseph, Carl Mayers, Gudakesh Moti, Anderson Phillip, Raymond Reefer, uh, Jaden Seals, Devon Thomas, and reserves, Tej Narayan, Shander Paul, and Sherman Lewis. I don't know if that's injury reserves. They haven't actually clarified what those reserves are, but also you'll note that that's only 12 players in the test squad. They have, they have said that should Kumar Roach prove his fitness, he would be added as the 13th player um, in that test squad. Boy, Nikhil, I'll let you pick the first talking point from that. Where do you want to start, Nikhil? I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Mash. Um, the Shamar Brooks one, that to me, I, I really am puzzled in terms of, of 
how I think this has been a reoccurring problem. I call for, I think before the England series, allowing someone to be in a rhythm. I, it just seems with Shamar Burns that they, they just have a very small margin of error for him. I mean, yes, he got the four innings against England, highest score of 39, didn't do so much. But it's very hard for me to sit here and watch Shamar Brooks play in the, in the Red Ball Championship one game, then break, play a couple games for the West Indies, then come back for one game. Cricket is a very rhythm thing. I mean, I'm not an international player, but on, on my interactions with players, just watching the game and learning about the game, it's extremely hard to just go in and out and, and just be able to produce and manufacture runs. At the end of the day, this is, a, is our highest level in the Caribbean. I think especially given the construct of this team, you're without a Jason Holder in that batting lineup. You know, obviously, Kimar Roach, we're not sure about him in the bowling attack. But it's just a very inexperienced team. I look at the top order as well, you know, with a potential of Devin Thomas making his debut. Um, you come down the list, you'll have Kyle Mears, et cetera. But I think for this home series, I would have gone back to Brooks. And also the fact that you look at the previous selections, someone like a Casey Carty, a Sherman Lewis, these guys were selected, Casey Carty, for the Netherlands ODI series because they had impressed in the presence 11 game. If I, to correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. Yeah, correct. But here we have Shamar Brooks, who scored 350s, sorry, 250s and 100 in his last four innings in, yes, one-day cricket, granted. But do we really have that much red ball cricket that we have the luxury of saying he didn't perform in red ball cricket? I don't think he's been given enough opportunity. It's extremely harsh to me to drop a man that I think is going to buy at number three or four for you in the top order and change the experience of that top order. Uh, for this upcoming series. And I honestly fear for, for the batting lineup because of the inexperience on display. I personally would have gone with Brooks and I think he's been extremely hard done by to, to leave to be left out, especially given the you know rhythm that he's in in, in one international cricket. And and people make the excuse about the ODI team in Pakistan. But Jada Seals is currently in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Kyle Mears is currently in Pakistan. Azari Joseph and the list goes on and on. So I don't know if that's really a suitable excuse for why he can't be in this test team. Santoki, so before you come in, so Brian mm. says, let Brooks do his thing in ODI, his red ball game is uh. Now, the thing is, I actually agree with Nikhil, though. Because, and Nikhil, I'm surprised you didn't make this argument. Against England, in fact, when we did this um, show before the England series, you and I both said, Nikhil, give Shamar Brooks his run now. Let's give him a run. A run to me doesn't mean one series and you're out. And that's why, when we get to John Campbell, that's why I was never going to drop John Campbell. Because my thing was... Once Desi and Ronnie had said, you know what, Campbell and Brooks are in. They're, they're the opener and they're the number three. A run means you've got to give them at least a couple series. You can't give them one series and then say, you know what, it's a flop. You're out again. And mm -hmm. this is now where I agree with Nikhil's other point. Bonner's in Pakistan. Mayers is in Pakistan. Forget Seals and Alzari now. We're talking about the batters, right? They're in Pakistan playing old guys and we're in the Netherlands. Bonner has just come off the Netherlands series with 150. He's just made 70 versus Pakistan in that first old guy. Clearly, the man's in Brooks. Sorry? You have said Bonner, but you mean... Oh, sorry, Brooks. Meant, sorry, Brooks people. Sorry. He's just made 70 in the in the first old guy versus Pakistan. The, the man is in touch. I just don't understand what rationale there was. So much so that after he made the 100 or 70 in whichever, in whichever game... Um, I, I tweeted, go and find it, people, because I always back up my stats and facts. I tweeted and I said, Brooks should have done enough to solidify his place in the test squad. Because obviously he can't go back and play some red ball cricket. He can only go on whatever form he's in. Santoki, I'm baffled. I'm actually baffled how Brooks has held a drop here. I would have given him a run. If he flopped versus Bangladesh, then you drop him. What, what's your thoughts? Um, uh, Boy, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's true. It is a contradiction because, like you said, for instance, Bonner's out there in Pakistan. Um, and we've seen various players. The only thing I can think of is, like you said, he's playing ODI and potentially because of his age. I know he's similar age to Bonner, but he's like, he's coming up to 34. They might have said, let's just give him a rest for this. Other than that, there's no logical reason. As you said, it's it's a contradiction, contradiction message. Um, and I think what Nikhil said is right. The batting is very precarious at the moment because we've obviously, we can back Craig Brathwaite to, to perform in this series based on his form. But Bon has been in Pakistan and Netherlands, so he's going to be coming straight into that side from Pakistan. It's going to be hard for him to adjust to test cricket again off that. And he, him and Brathwaite are sort of like the glue at the moment with our top order. So for me, there are concerns with batting and obviously the bowling as well. 
we haven't got Roach and Gabriel, who've been a staple of our bowling attack for so many years and so many series. So we're reliant on essentially young Jaden Seals to kind of carry the bowling and hope that Anderson Phillip and Azari Joseph, one of them, or both hopefully, can step up with the ball. So it will be interesting because it is... I could see us struggling against our Bangladesh if things don't go our way based on kind of the makeup of the lineup at the moment. So I want to just deal with this point. So I've had two people now. Thank you, everyone, in the messages, by the way. The, 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 your engagement is as much for everybody in the chat as it is for us. It helps guide our conversation as well. So Mr. Lover says, OK, Michelle, Brooks is in touch, but Souls King and Hope, should they be given the run? No, because my point is, well, Hope certainly not, because Hope's had his run. That, okay, so that, that rules out Shea immediately. He's had his run. Brooks, my point with Brooks is he never got really a long run in the side. Okay, so King, I feel sorry for Brandon. He's only been able to have his one red ball match. Then he's gone to white ball cricket, etc. My point is the selectors recalled Brooks to the England series. I think you set a bad precedent. Unless a man gets duck, 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 duck. How do you call a man for a series and then just drop him after one series and say you're done with him? That just doesn't make sense. If he'd gone to the Netherlands and Pakistan and flopped, then I get it. I totally understand why you'd make the call. I just don't think the rationale is there. I'm not fighting it down. Like, what's done is done. I just don't think the rationale is there to, 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 to justify the Brooks decision. Now, the next talking point then is if Brooks is gone, it looks like Devon Thomas is the person that will possibly replace him unless Kyle Mayers is selected as a top order batter and everybody moves up one. But it look if you look at that side, it looks like, boy, I don't even know what that batting lineup's looking like really and truly. <laughs> but, uh, boy, I can't work it out. But it looks like Devin Thomas might be a like-for-like -like replacement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, gentlemen, Devin Thomas, let's, call, let's give him his due. In fact, there was an Antiguan in the... Here we go. Uh, is it Ilzam Arfin? Are you Antiguan or are you just a fan of West Indies cricket? I don't have a problem with Devon Thomas in the side. Antiguan players always get the hard end of the stick. I don't know about that. But what I will say is this. Devon Thomas was the third highest run scorer this year. 414 runs at an average of 59, 100, 450s. Other than Craig, you'd argue that statistically he probably had the best output given about given the, the the range between the hundreds and fifties his strike rate for me was interesting a lot of his innings if you go and look at them were they were aggressive innings yeah. i i am slightly concerned that i don't know if that brand of cricket is going to succeed in test cricket um for the west indies and remember so when england came he got his chance in that presence 11 game and he got duck and duck um now Desi has given Devon his chance. And actually, let me read what Desi said. Desi said, Devon Thomas has been knocking on the door for quite some time. He's done extremely well in our franchise cricket system. And we view this as a good opportunity to now give him a goal. That sounds like, well, it's Bangladesh. And so now he's, this is his chance to, to get a goal. Um, before you answer, please, people, just because I realised that Vitamin did send in a, a super chat. Great show, great reporting over the last two weeks. I think the squad is fine. I'm expecting Pace to do most of the work and get the job done. Expect Multi to miss out. Thomas, good. So uh, Vitamin mentioned Thomas, so we can go there. Thomas is in form and he randomly shouts out Kieran Powell as well. But um, uh, who wants to go first with Devon Thomas? Does he deserve this chance? Is it right that he's replaced Brooks? Because effectively that's what he's done. Go on, Nikhil. I'll let you go first. I think, yeah, I think he, he deserves it, man. It, listen, I think based on what selectors have said for years, this four-day championship is supposed to be a reward system into into this test team but here we have it again someone that did not play in the last presence 11 or maybe did he i'll check it but i'm pretty sure that i could be wrong but i thought i don't remember seeing a devon thomas in the last presence 11 he game. was not the kill he was he got zero and zero okay cool perfect well he was well fair enough selectors tested him at the, the presence seven game yes he didn't perform there but that being said i do think based on what they've said over the years the first class setup needs to be a feeder into the test team for whatever reason, they've opted against Brooks. And if they had to pick someone else next in line, I think Devon Thomas is the man. But I'm going to throw another interesting scenario at you guys, which actually I never thought about until five seconds ago when you guys were calling out the, the batting lineup, etc. Ray Murray for, I think in two out of the five games this year, has batted at number three for the Barbados Pride. I look at the bowling attack with Rifa sort of at eight in that Jason Holder role. 
And I really fear for the strength, given the inexperience with a, with a Rifa, with a Jaden Steele, obviously, who's now still getting ingrained in West East cricket. Azari Joseph, who has immense ability, but hasn't been the consistent wicket taker that we expect him to be. And he's getting there. I was impressed in England, in the England series. What about the proposition exactly? Batting Rifa, Rema Rifa at number three. Um, he just got two scores of 70 odd, I think. It was um, for Barbados, batting at number three. I think I may support, believe it or not, refund at number three because and leaving Bon at four coming on the list. It then allows you to play Anderson Phillip, Jaden Seals, Alzari Joseph as the three out and out seamers. And then you have the backup options of a Ray Marifo who can come in as a wicket take option, as well as Kyle Mears, who has already shown us that he can produce some wicket taking deliveries. And then you still have the spin of, of Godekesh Moti. I think that could be the way that they're going because when they look at this team, besides Davin Thomas and Bonner, I don't really see who else can bat at number three or four. Uh, besides those two. So I think Rifa could be an option at number three. And the funny thing that I also think, in the game where Shea Hope, Roston Chase, and all these guys, before they went off to Netherlands, played, Rifa batted at eight. However, when they left, no, well, sorry, not eight, at number six or seven, when they left, he was then asked to go to number three. So was it a case that the selectors called Barbados Pride and said, we're looking at him as a number three realistic option. Can he bat at number three? And he did that and got runs. So I think it could be a viable option. You know, I wouldn't be. Oh, sorry, go on, sir. Yeah. I was going to say I wouldn't be against the idea. I, I saw a bit of him against Trinidad. I think he batted 160 odd balls, scored a nice 79 batting at three. Looked comfortable. Reef has always had a had a great technique and looks like an accomplished batsman when I've seen him play. So I wouldn't be against him batting at three. I don't think it would be far fetched to have him move up the order. Yeah, the the argument you present, Nikhil, I can I can get behind that argument. I understand the rationale. Uh, behind that my worry when i saw the west indies side was who's gonna who's gonna be the um who's gonna be the people who stick it out and i just worry i hope devon's got the defensive if he does play i hope he's got the defensive technique for test cricket and doesn't just i hope he doesn't well i'd love to him to replicate what he did in first class cricket but i just don't know if that's going to stand up at the at the highest um well, level. i also i also think we need to give devon Dominic a chance as well because if you think about it like bono and brooks got given their chance later on in their careers as well after playing in first class cricket and not having the greatest record over their careers in first class so devon thomas could flourish in test cricket as well i wouldn't write him off but it'd be interesting to see if they do go for him uh so let's go to the obvious talking point um, well, there's two more. There's two big talking points I haven't mentioned yet. But let's go to the biggest one because when I was on the Facebook groups and stuff, the thing that was causing the biggest cuss out was John Campbell retaining his spot. So let me just do a quick Jamaica defensive mission here. Uh, so <laughs> I have, I don't care what anyone says, I have no problem with John Campbell retaining his spot. I want everybody to know that that I'm still back in John Campbell. But let me let me give you an um, actual criteria for why. One, him and Craig actually get 50 run partnerships. Now, some people listen to that and be like, 50 runs, but come on, this is West Indies cricket. That's like getting 150 run partnership. So him, him and Craig managed to find their way to get 50 run partnerships. Now, obviously, someone will say to me, yeah, but if John's only making 30 of that, so what? But listen, we're not used to, in this modern era, an opening batting partnership that can get past 50. I actually think John Campbell is a good player. He just has brain fades at about the 20 to 30 run mark. But actually, and I know that's not good enough. I know that's not good enough. But technique wise, Nikhil, you might actually back up this next point I'm about to make. Against England, I thought you could see that it actually worked on his technique. And more the issue for England was he just has brain fades. It's not a, I don't think it's a technique issue. I just don't. I think it's more a concentration issue than it than it is a technique issue. Now, obviously, you can say, well, that's good enough to drop John Campbell then, and Tay should have uh, had his chance. But again, it's the same point I made for Brooks. Once Desmond Haynes and Ronnie Sarwan had made the decision that John Campbell was going to be the opener against the England series, I don't think you can jettison him after three games. I think you have to give him the next series, and if he flops versus back. Uh, back versus Bangladesh, then you've got your enough evidence to say, you know what, John, we tried again. You're still not cutting it. Y your time's done now. It's time to bring through Tej to debut in Australia. <laughs> so, but, um, I, I, I don't know. I don't, 
Santoki, I'm going to let you come first because I know the heel's coming for me. <laughs> I'm hoping you're going to be the mid-ground. What I'm saying, Santoki, is I don't hate the Campbell decision. I'm not hating on it. I think it's questionable. You've got a man who's played 18 tests and is averaging 23. And even against England, on probably the flattest decks you'll see for a long time, he still couldn't score a half century. So for me, it's baffling that he's managed to stay in the squad as opener. Um, it is what it is. They obviously see something about him, but I just think if you're averaging 23 after 18 tests, like I don't know what you're doing in an international test side at this level. No, no, hold on. Let me come back in. Let me let me come oh. back in. And before the kill destroys me, I also think we have to point out that Campbell didn't do enough in the West Indies Championship to then deserve a drop. Like if he'd gone to the if he'd gone into our season now and then flopped through the five round season, I think it makes it easier to say, well, boy. You're out. But yeah. remember, remember, he made 398 runs, an average of 50, 100 and 150. And if people are calling Tej, Tej was only about 40 runs ahead of him in terms of cumulative um, run outcomes. So I can understand yeah. why they would have thought, well, it's not like he's gone to a full flop. Nikhil, in you come. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm say I'm coming for you much. I just think there's a difference in opinion. Mm -hmm. I think John Campbell's benefiting from the fact that the West Indies won. They actually won. I think you, it's very hard to break a winning formula up. But in that, I, I in the same sentiments, I say that here you are dropping a Shamar Brooks. So th this is my thing on it. I think, as you mentioned, uh, let me start with, with defending and not defending, but let me start with why I think John Campbell is important. As you said, I think out of the, all the openers that have been tried along across the years for the West Indies, when you look at Craig Brathwaite, his opening partner, I think John Campbell fits him the best. Because of that intent to score, just because of the rapport that they have together, obviously played cricket together for so long. All of these things, Craig is a captain, many of these things come into play. But I don't know if we can use that same argument that you've used for Shamar Brooks on John Campbell in terms of the consistent run. Because as Santoki said, he has 18 test matches, Mash. I was all for him getting this run, but you look at that England series. Yes, I agree with you in the first test, especially. I was impressed with, you know, his ability left a lot more balls outside the off stump. Showed me that he had a bit more temperament, but 4, 10, 35, and 6, to me, is not good enough uh, for some, in terms of to, to retain a position. And you mentioned giving Tej that opportunity in Australia. It's extremely tough, as Chandrika showed us. I saw somebody earlier mention it. It's extremely tough to start your test career against Mitchell Stark, Pat Cummins, Josh Hazelwood. Um, so, so that is another thing in itself. But I think if Tej Narayan Chanapal hadn't started to perform the way he did in these last couple of games, maybe I would have advocated for John Campbell to get it. But given a man has spent, now, now listen to this, 1,211 minutes. That's 20 hours at the crease. 20 in the 200s alone. The 184 and 140 not out. Now, Wells, yes, people will say, oh, you know, if they bat, they'll get 50 by lunch. If him and Craig Brathwaite bat together. I think when you look at our body lineup, especially in this series where we're going to be inexperienced, you don't have a real outlook in terms of that top order. There's no Jason Holder. I think I may have wanted to go for that extra bit of temperament, that extra bit of time at the crease, concentration. Um, and, and based on the fact that I, for me personally, I like to move with, I would rather move with the unknown than the known in the sense that we sort of know what we're getting from John Campbell. 18 test matches in a long time. I may have gone for Tejan and Chanapal to, to try him. But at the, at the end of the day, I think John Campbell is, is benefiting from the fact that the West Indies have won. He gets them off to a good start. And as you keep saying, and everyone keeps saying, his technique, I mean, every time this man goes out to bat, I, I think this is going to be the time where John Campbell gets that big hundred. And then some way, somehow, he just gives it away. But he's definitely there. It's just that, I, I don't know, for whatever reason it is, just doesn't get those 50s consistently. But at the end of the day, as you said, it's picked. And I, I back him all the way. I think, you know, it's a perfect opportunity on, in, on a very flat Antiguan surface for him to cash in and get some runs. Demo coming through for me. Opening partnerships are crucial for cricket teams, especially for one with a brittle batting lineup. John and Craig during the England series, 89, 59, 50, and then the last innings where we won 28. So again, I, it wouldn't surprise me if they've looked at something like that and said, well, boy, at least Craig and John have a good partner, uh, have good knowledge of each other as an opening pair. So it, it could be something as simplistic as that. Um, people, uh, we're nearly going to wrap this one up. Every, uh, 
I think there's one more talking point and I'm going to let Santoki go with it. Santoki, Permo out. We don't know if that's due to bereavement. It could be mm. for all I know. Uh, it's not being said, but maybe they, but then he played for Guyana. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Permo out, good a cash in. Um, one guy needs out for another guy needs. Now, you and I were going back and forth on the WhatsApp earlier this week. And I was saying, in fact, I think it was in the one with Nikhil. And I was saying that I think that Moti's actually a better bowler than Permo. But at the same time, again, we go back to the Brooks argument, the Campbell argument. I didn't think Permo had done bad enough as the incumbent to justify being dropped. So it's an it's an interesting call, your view, Santoki. Yeah, I, d I didn't think Permo had done had done badly against. Obviously, in England, the first test he struggled, but I don't think in the in the second test he he done that badly. So for me, it's a, it's a strange one because. He hasn't got that run of tests. He only got back into the side against Sri Lanka, which was three tests ago. So unless, like you say, the bereavement he suffered, they thought maybe he's not mentally right to play at international level, which is different from regional. That's the only thing I could think of. And it's interesting because Moti's obviously jumped ahead of the queue now of Warwickon. There were rumours that Akil is saying, obviously, he played one first-class game. He was in the running, but they've gone for Moti. He had a good average, 24, with the ball in the regional season. He does a lot, a lot of movement. He gets a lot out and he can bat as well. So I'm excited to see Moti in the test squad, but it is a puzzling decision when you look at it from all sort of points of view that they have opted to go without more without Warwick and they've got, they've taken a step into the unknown here, which kind of contradicts what they've done with John Campbell, where they've played it safe. You would think they would go for Pamor or Warwick and as the left arm spinner in this side. But let's see, maybe Moti, they've got a lot of faith in his potential. So, Nikhil, how do you justify the Moti decision? I just, I don't, I don't know if I'm reading something wrong or if I'm missing something, but I just keep looking at this Bangladesh squad and I just see a bunch of left-handers. So the fact that they picked a left arm spinner, I don't really understand the premise. For me, it has to be Raheem Cornwall. And then in the last presidency of a game against England, Brian Charles was a spinner. Hmm. So how is it that Morty, yes, mind you, he did bowl well, as Santoki said, average of 24. Um, they didn't have the Guyanese pitches, you know, to, to really bring forward the numbers. But <laughs> yes, he got that 100 and may, may be select, may, that batting may have pushed him over the edge of the fact that he can get 100 in, a, in what's going to be an experienced lineup. But I just think, I just don't know how he can leapfrog the entire system and just go straight into the test team. And by all looks of it, it's going to play. This first this first test against Bangladesh being the only spinner in, in the 12. So I, I really don't know. Um, for me personally, yes, somebody's saying Craig will bowl. But I, I just don't know if Craig is, in terms of his off spin, is uh, that consistent of an option. I just can't believe. I think Raheem Cornwall, because we're disrespecting Cornwall's body. No, let's not forget the 250s against Sri Lanka late last year it was. Um, I just I just find it amazing given that Cornwall took the most wickets. It's not like he had a terrible year that you can justify it. He just he's just completely out of it. So I think a lot of questions to be asked. Um Morty is, is a decent building block. But as you said, Mash, it's very hard for Pomal. Not like he, he's playing any white ball cricket, etc. So he just has this red ball cricket. I mean, a couple handful of test matches in Sharanka, handful here, handful there. Yeah, it's extremely difficult, man. I, I think he should feel a little hard done by, but I, I can't I can't rectify it to be honest, but I wish I wish more to all the best. Yeah, I've 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 got to agree. I've I've got no explanation or rationale for it. As much as I can say I think Moti is a better spinner, I can't I can't find the rationale. And that you used a good phrase, Nikhil. I can't find the rationale of how he leapfrogged everyone else. Forget per mole, mm. his leapfrog Warrican, his leapfrog Cornwall, his leapfrog Brian Charles. I so I don't I don't understand the rationale how he just went past everybody else um, into the side. As but I do think he's a very talented um, bowler. I don't get me wrong. I think he has he has immense ability. I just would like to see him cut, just like a Nicholas Pura and how we make the test argument all the time. I want to see them come through the system a bit more. A few more first class games, play the President Eleven game, but to go straight into the test team, I think is a huge ask. But don't get me wrong, he has immense ability. Sorry to cut you. Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm not going to ask you to name. In fact, no, maybe I am. Let's end this. Let's bring this one to a close, and I'll do it the following way. Um, people, by the way, I see that there's 114 of you live. Um, actually, Ian, yes, uh, Nikhil's good friend, Ian. I'm going to call Ian a good friend as well, Mr. Best. Um, he's, I'm presuming Ian is referring to uh, Desmond. Maybe that is it. Maybe they're just looking at some options. But then that makes me worried that we're taking Bangladesh a bit lightly to believe that we can just look at a few people. Bangladesh aren't bad um so it, 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 it's interesting certainly um but as i was saying 
Uh, 119 of you now live in the chat. Thank you. This is about to come to an end. So do share it, people, 120. Do let people know. Uh, send it into your WhatsApp group chats, the Facebook group chats, etc. And say, yo, do you know what? There's, these three guys know what they're talking about on West Indies cricket, you know. Da, 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 da. Uh, Demo says there's not even 30 likes. So if you're alive right now, before you go, just press that like button and press that subscribe button as well. It really helps the podcast, etc. But, uh, gents, to end it off, so the first test um, starts, let me just remind myself, I think it is next Wednesday. Let me look at the dates. Thursday. Next Thursday, people. For day one is next Thursday, uh, the 16th. So we are about one week away. I don't know who wants to go first, but if the pitch was everything you wanted it to be, what's your side? Because looking at that 11, boy, I don't even know what a suitable 11 is, you know. Um, and remember, only, at the top, there's only... There's Roach only twelve. There. Of, there's only twelve yeah. in the squad. There. There's only Sorry, twelve. Was... Include Roach. Assuming Roach is fit, hmm. then can you even pick him? He's not played any cricket. Yeah. So forget Roach. Forget Roach. Roach can't play because even if he passes a fitness test, what cricket has he played for Barbados or anybody since getting the injury for Surrey? So I don't think we can consider Roach. Who wants to go first? What's what's your side? I would, go. I would say Rafael Campbell. Um, pretty obvious openers. I would I would go for the up for the Remory for option number three. I think he's shown me enough in terms of the technique, but also that ability to stick out some really tough periods. Um, he's not like he's just batted once at number three. Also in the presence, he's having game he batted at number five, came in relatively early. I would go for Remory for at three. Bono four, Kyle Mears at number five, Blackwood six, to Silva seven. That that's pretty standard. But then and I purposely played with at three over uh, Devin Thomas because I think I look at the Al Sari option, Jaden Steele's. Jaden Seals is an extremely talented individual, but I don't think he's the leader of attack yet. I think he, he's relied a lot on Akeem Aro to Jason Holder, et cetera, to, to really guide him. But in this now, he becomes the most experienced bowler of these seamers. So for that reason, I would opt to play Anderson Phillip at eight because I think he provides a bit extra in terms of that, uh, a wicket-taking option. Morty has the lone spin at nine. There's no batting order. Azari Joseph and, and Jaden Seals, that would round out my, my 11. So you have the three. Seamers and Philip Joseph Seals, Morty has a spin, and then you have Mears and Rifa that can give you spurts, you know, in terms of as added options. So who was who was out? Oh, just Thomas, sorry, oh, just Thomas. Just the, uh, Devin Thomas, yeah. Right, Santo. Before you come in, Chatil says if Roach is fit, he just walks straight back in. Um, hmm. I'm still not convinced on that. I, 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 can you call back somebody who passes a fitness test with no cricket? When was that injury, Santo? You weren't it back in like. It's about six when weeks ago, yeah. April, early April that he got yeah. injured for Surrey. Can you really, as as brilliant as Roach is, can you? What if he breaks down? Anyway, so tell me, what's your side? No, I, literally, I I think Thomas is gonna be the one who doesn't play in the eleven. So I would essentially go with what Nikhil said. I think Reefa, bearing in mind he played for Barbados at three, and Nikhil's logic as well sort of added to it. I think they'll go with that. So I would go with the same lineup lineup Nikhil's gone for actually. Well, I'm going for something different. So hear me now. Hear my lineup, people. I think it's obviously Campbell and uh, Campbell and uh, sorry, Brathwaite and Campbell. Remember, I think Bonner goes back to three. Mm. I think they make Bonner back three in the absence. If, if if Brooks is out, I think Bonner goes three. Then I've got Thomas at four. I think Thomas is going to debut. I think Thomas at four, May is at five, Blackwood at six. But can I just say, here's something we have to consider. Remember that Jermaine Blackwood actually bats three for Jamaica. And I think people mm. forget this just because he's reckless for the West Indies. For Jamaica, Blackwood is actually trusted to bat in the top four. So don't be surprised if Blackwood actually comes in the top three or four. Obviously, enough, enough people have heart attacks if that happens. But just don't be surprised if that happens. And remember, his vice captain, he should be taking more responsibility. He should be batting down at five. Um, but anyways, um, May is five, Blackwood six. I think Reefer is coming in as an immediate like for like for Jason Holder. I don't think they're going to bat him up the order. I think they just replace him for Jason Holder. So I've got Reefer at seven, Josh at eight, um, Alzari at nine, Seals, and then I think Philip or Multi will sit. If the pitch takes spin, Multi plays. If they don't think the pitch is going to take spin, he holds a drop and Philip plays. I I'm would rather Antigua is going to is going to yeah. try. So, okay, so, there, so if you're saying play. that, if you're saying that, I would rather play multi. And I think you go with the idea that Joseph and Seals, Reefer, Reefer is better than, I think people think Reefer is just some ordinary medium pacer. No, no, no. Reefer, 
I don't know where you stand on this, Nikhil. I think Reefer's a better bowler than Mayers. Oh, I think, I think so as well. But at the same time, he is coming off an injury, and I, I just wonder how those knees are going to hold up if he's to bowl twenty overs. And also, if in my case or Santoki's case, if he's bad at number three, I don't expect him to bowl fifteen overs a day or, or twenty overs because I think that's ridiculous. So I think it depends on his role. Uh, but surely, I think I've said it for a long time. I'm a firm believer of even when Jason Holt is in the squad. I was a believer that, that Raymond Rufa could play alongside him in terms of that's just how good he was with the ball, in terms of being able to swing, etc. But that's a story for another day. Um, I do think he's an extremely capable bowler for sure. So in that case, then, people, Santokian, Nikula saying Thomas sits. I'm saying Phillips sits. I think we'll go with a pace attack of Joseph Seals, Rifa and Mayers and Moti as the spinner. But if Kimar Roach is fit, that changes the whole equation and the whole game. Um, but 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 that's where we're at, people. Um, Santoki, I'll let you end this one off. Cool. So there you have it, guys. Not long, just over a week. We've obviously got the Pakistan series, still two ODIs to go, but just over a week to the test series against Bangladesh. Just keep, if you're not following us already, at Carry Cricket, Instagram, Twitter, we'll be updating on all the games anytime. News, matches, results, anything, just follow us there. And um, thanks, everyone. Over 100 people joining live. I know it's early in the Caribbean, so it's a big achievement for us. And obviously, more people will probably watch it on the replays in the coming hours and days and stuff. But Nikhil, as always, valuable insights. Always a pleasure to get your wisdom on the show, man. Thank you so much for having me, guys. You know, you guys are big ones now on TV and stuff. So anytime I could get a little piggyback on some exposure, always happy, man. Anytime, happy to come on. Yeah, and let your let your agent know we'll pay him in installments for having you on the, on the fee because I know it's a bit yeah, pricey. Yeah. We so. we, we, unless we get more super chats, we can't pay your fee to appear. <laughs> So look, look out for an installment, one a month, until we can pay it off. But anybody who's watching this, CPL and all that lot, bring us in. Us three are ready to just do the whole of CPL for you this year, you know. So so, so bring us in and let us do the coverage for you. But Nikhil, big up yourself. Um, thank you for coming on, etc. And remember, ladies and gents, Pakistan versus the West Indies um, tomorrow morning. Let's rally around the the, uh, the team. We did, we did much better than you would have thought we would have done um, in that first. Oh, sorry, good point. Sorry, Summit. Uh, sorry, Nikhil. Summit had this question: Will you be in the states for the minor league cricket this year? Yeah, I'm planning to, man. Um, things are not fully confirmed yet, but by all means, hopefully, hopefully, I'll be there, man. So definitely looking forward to linking up with you, Summit. There you have an exclusive, exclusive guys. So keep an eye out for that in America. Nikhil will be there, front in the coverage. But Mash, it's been a pleasure as always, hasn't it? Most definitely. I'm gonna go out to the shop now and uh, go buy myself a an ice cream and maybe a Magnum. So big up yourselves, people. <laughs> big up yourselves, people. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we are the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket. By the fans, for the fans. Thank you.